I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. Today's episode is a discussion of the brand new groundbreaking book, Lacan and Race, Racism, Identity, and Psychoanalytic Theory, just published by Rutledge. We have with us the editors, Sheldon George and Derek Hook, as well as contributors, Sheila Kavanaugh and Michelle Stevens. For links to this book and the rest of their work, just follow the text accompanying this episode. You can find the episode page at renderingunconscious.org. As always, there is a video accompanying this episode at YouTube. Just search for Rendering Unconscious Podcast at YouTube. We're lo- located at Tripart Films YouTube channel. That's T R A P A R T Film at YouTube. The conference Psychology and the Other is coming up September 17th through 19th and is virtual. So be sure to join us at Psychology and the Other 2021. Links can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Tripart Books, 2019. You can visit our publisher's website, tripart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. Thank you for supporting the podcast at our Patreon. If you're not already a patron, you can join for as low as $2 a month. Your support is so appreciated. It really helps me keep my pizzazz and keep on going. Just visit patreon.com forward slash Vanessa23Carl. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you to all our Patreon patrons and to all the listeners of Rendering Unconscious Podcast. Your support is so appreciated. All right, Sheldon, so you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. So uh, the main reason we're here today is to, is, is to talk a little bit about the new book, Lacan and Race, um, which is, we hope, um, a groundbreaking entry into the topic of race um, in connection to Lacan. Um, you know, as we mentioned in our foreword, uh, before this book, um, there really wasn't too much that was being done uh, on the topic of Lacan and race. There was um, around the year 2000, there was an interest in psychoanalysis and race. Um, and a number of books came out around that year, including Christopher Lane's book, um, which, you know, um, which was one of the, the, the important texts on the topic and one that I, I think we're trying to, in some ways, emulate and continue the work of. Um, but there were a few others, Anne Cheng's The Melancholy of Race. Um, um, yeah, um, but until, um, uh, and, and also, uh, I, I think one important piece was Kalpanasus Audrey Crixus, Desire and Whiteness, which was really the first piece to bring together uh, Lacanian theory and race. Um, so we saw this gap and we wanted to fill it. Um, and we brought in um, some of the few people who were already working on this topic, including Michelle, who had done her book, um, Skin Acts. Um, and Sheila had also written on skin. Um, 
so we brought in uh, people from different fields. We have 16 authors who've contributed to the book um, and 15 chapters plus an intro and a um, afterward by Kalpanis as Audrey Crooks. Um, and it really takes race, I think, in new directions, um, especially uh, the chapters by uh, Michelle and Gautam, um, which uh, end the text and uh, think about um, a movement from a focus on race as connected to the signifier uh, in ways that people like Kalpana had discussed it um, in Desire and Whiteness um, to more of a focus on the real, more of a focus on things like sexuation. Um, so it, I, I think it really is a new direction for the study of psychoanalysis and race and specifically Lacanian psychoanalysis. Derek, do you wanna add? I think that's, that's really well said and um, it hopefully situates the book. I mean, maybe one additional or two additional comments. One is when um, Sheldon and I were doing a kind of broad literature review as part of the introduction, we realized that there's a wide spectrum of different um, political applications of Lacanian social theory. You know, whether we think about, you know, uh, theories of, of sexuation, whether we think about um, ideology critique, whether we think about Laclau and Mouffe and how people have used Lacan in various kind of towards a leftist agenda, you could say. There's a variety, you know, Marxist forms of Lacan. But in actual fact, given all of that material, um, uh, theories of sexuality, queer theory, all of these applications uh, are, are Lacan. The use of Lacan to the thinking of race and racism was somewhat smaller, was somewhat underdeveloped, and that, that was very noticeable. Um, and then the other point, just to, to add to that, just to stress what we were trying to do with the book and why it does seem to fill a gap of sorts, was that many colleagues of mine, particularly who would work in the domain of, say, phenom studies uh, and critical race theory, have often had a rather suspicious view of, of Lacanian psychoanalysis, thinking that this is maybe a less than viable resource. Um, and someone like David Marriott, of course, who's made a lot of contributions and of course has a, has a brand new book precisely linking Lacan and Afro-pessimism, you know, rightly remarks that what remains unthought at some level is the very whiteness of, of Lacanian theory at some level. So from both those sides, I think the book is trying to say Lacanian social theory is about to and is doing more to think about race and racism, which we are trying to progress. Um, and we're also trying to say that Lacanian social theory has a really crucial, if not indeed essential role to play in thinking about um, racism, racial formations, anti-blackness in the 21st century. And, and those are really some of the most important animating origins of the book. So, um... One of the things that we wanted to do in, uh, in this interview is sort of foreground some of the ideas of the book. And, um, you know, one way that we thought we could do that was by having some of the contributors talk a little bit about their essays, give you a sense of the content of the book, um, just to give you a general overview before we have Sheila and Michelle say something about their pieces. I'll just give you a general sense of um, what's in the book. So as I said, uh, 16 authors, 15 chapters. Um, we have uh, an essay on lynching, just a general overview here, an essay on lynching um, and race as fantasy by Todd McGowan. Um, Derek has a piece on the theft of enjoyment thesis, which is something that sort of developed out of the work of people like Zizak and um, Jacques Miller, the, the notion that racism is connected to an idea of um, stolen jouissance. So Derek introduces, contextualizes, and revises that idea. Um, there is a focus on... Um, Confederate signifiers, the use of um, statues, the battle over Confederate statues and whether or not they should be taken down. Um, that's a piece that's written by Hilary Neroni. Um, 
we also have a piece that focuses on um, white nationalism and the manifestos that the, that white nationalist killers have produced over the years. It's written by um, E. Chibrolu. Um, there's a piece by uh, Wayne, um, excuse my pronunciation, Wayne, Wampimukwa. Um, he is a, a, a Canadian resident who is focused on um, um, indigenous uh, peoples and um, laws in Canada that um, edipalize um, indigenous groups. Um, Jennifer Friedlander has a piece on traversing race. Um, Derek has a second piece on um, apartheid desire and ideology. Molly Rothenberg has a piece on race groups um, and, and, and the pathological associations, the neuroses and perversions that appear um, in race groups. Um, and Sheila, of course, will talk about her piece. Patricia Garavici um, has a piece on the concept of the soul in psychoanalysis, where she makes the argument that um, the, the, the term psyche was originally um, a word for the soul. Um, and so what psychoanalysis treats at some level is the soul. And she connects this to the idea that um, indigenous um, peoples in, uh, conquered by Spaniards were seen as not having souls. Mm -hmm. And she moves from there to talking about um, her own treatment of her patients and um, her assertion that they have an unconscious, they have a soul that needs to be treated and shouldn't be determined by income. Um, and we have a piece on Afro-pessimism that's co-authored by Corinne Malone and Tiara Jackson, um, followed by a piece on Japanese, um, Japanese identity in relation to the signifier that sort of uh, confronts Lacan's argument in the um, <clears throat> in the introduction to the Japanese translation of Lacan's A Cree, where Lacan makes the statement that the Japanese have no need for have no need to be psychoanalyzed because they have a different relation to the signifier. So, how does the signifier work um, in different cultures? Um, and then my piece is focused on sexuation, followed by Michelle's piece on Lacan's Lamella and Gautam's piece on um, Fanon's concept of the zone of non-being and the afterword by Kalpanis' Audrey Crooks. Um, Michelle or Sheila, would either of you like to say something about your pieces? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for the uh, introduction to the book and the welcome to this fantastic podcast. Um, I want to say that I am just really thrilled and excited about this book for a number of reasons. Um, but one of them for me in particular is, you know, in my cultural milieu, in my university space, I'm really accustomed to people talking about racism as a problem of logic as a problem of mis miseducation, ignorance, something that can easily be corrected or dealt with at the level of, let's say, an anti-racist or equity policy, all of which is, of course, very, very important. But what we forget is that there's something we need to understand with respect to the tenacity and the longevity of racism that I think demands a psychoanalytic critique. We need to understand why people are passionately attached to systems of racism. I, I really like Derek's formulation following Zizek, thinking about the, the theft of Jouissant's thesis. I think that this starts to help us to understand some of the irrationality and also psychical investments and some very, very dangerous race-based thinking. Now, my piece is called, actually, I've forgotten what it's called. Um, uh, what is it? Perverse, that's so, what an interesting uh, slip. Uh, race, race perversion. Do you have it? Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, I got it. Race perversion and the jouissance, yeah, race perversion and the jouissance of 
uh, race in um, Portrait of Jason. Now, Portrait of Jason is a film, a uh, film by Shirley Clark in 1967. Uh, she filmed it in her Chelsea Hotel penthouse apartment. And the film is essentially based on an interview with an, a man named Jason Holiday. And this film is the first ever film featuring a gay black protagonist to uh, appear solo on screen without any other actors. And interestingly, this film uh, was distributed the same year as Sidney Poitier's, Poitier's film and Look Who's, Coming, Look Who's Coming Home for Dinner. And what I found really interesting is Sidney Poitier is, you know, this very sort of attractive, celebrated, heterosexual black man. But Jason Holliday, being a black gay sex worker slash hustler, you know, his sort of life story didn't seem to matter or resonate uh, with an American public as significantly as, as do other sort of more positive representations of black male protagonists. And in this interview, Shirley Clark does with Jason Holliday over the course of a 20, 24 hour period where she's video recording him is he talks about some really disturbing stories about racism that he has experienced in LA, in New York, in San Francisco. And he tells a story about racism and then he laughs. He tells another story and then he says, oh, oh, that didn't happen. That's not true. I made that up. And when I first watched this film, interestingly at the IFC Center in the West Village, I as an audience member sort of felt everything. I felt like I was being betrayed and tricked by Jason Holiday into sort of empathizing with him only to be told that something was a joke, something wasn't real, it didn't happen. I felt envy, I felt jealousy, I felt hurt, I felt a range of different emotions until I realized that what Jason Holiday was doing in this interview is in fact performing a kind of jouissance of race and challenging the filmmaker's intention to film a truth about race to sort of expose anything essential about his being as a racialized black man who was gay and was a sex worker, and instead was conveying something about affect and something about the psychical complexities of being subject to racism so systematically over the course of his life. And while this film has in later years in the 1990s been called racist and sort of dismissed, I thought, well, wait a second, there's something very interesting about Holiday's discourse that I think can be understood through the Lacanian frame of the pervert, specifically the discourse of the pervert. Now, this isn't to say that Jason Holiday is a pervert, but rather it's to say that he was using the discourse of perversion to say something about how he is tethered to the aggression of the other. And in his life, the aggression of white racist others who are very often white women who would employ him as a housekeeper. And so what he was dramatizing, I think, in this 24 hour interview, which has the feeling of a, an unbarred, uncut psychoanalytic session is something about the pain and pleasure and jouissance in race and racism. And I think that this is really important because I see Jason Holliday as developing a very, very, sophisticated psychoanalytic response to anti-Black racism that I think we're in danger of missing if we're too quick to dismiss a film as racist. Now this isn't to say that there might, that racism was not a part of the filming and the production and the distribution of this film, 
but we also need to think about what are the various possibilities at stake for racialized subjects in responding to racism, particularly at this moment in American history in 1967. And I also did a lot of research on Jason Holliday, the person, and um, you know, I'll stop here, but uh, in essence, I wanna say that my chapter was an attempt to offer you know, a queer race-based Lacanian informed analysis of Jason's discourse and performance to you know, recognize ways of responding to racism that sometimes get lost when we adopt, you know, a non-psychoanalytic anti-racist, you know, response. Sheila, that so reflects some of the um, insights that I really drew from looking at your chapter. And I think when I say a bit about what brought me into the project, you'll see some of the connections between why I was so interested in what you were doing. So I came to Lacanian theory um, for, first from something adjacent to social theory, which Derek mentioned, critical social theory, which I would call maybe more critical cultural theory and um, performative theory or performance theory. And it started because in the book Skin, Skin Axe, I was, I was very interested in the perspective and the subjectivity of the Black performer. And so all of my work really, in a sense, could be characterized as trying to understand theories of subjectivity and locate the place of the Black subject within those theories often they're not in those theories. So where, and why are they not? And where are they, right? And so I kind of came to the work thinking about black performers, specifically black male performers. And interestingly enough, Lacan was actually the crystallizing um, theoretical influence in helping me to think about a relational way of understanding the relationship between the black male performer and their audience. Um, and so my, uh, my place in psychoanalytic theory tends to come, I'm influenced by more of a relational psychoanalytic model, but my interest in Lacan is partly because I read him from a relational psychoanalytic perspective. It was always his, the dyadic structure of some of Lacan's work that I thought was interesting. There's always a gaze. It's not just a subject on their own. There's some, you know, it's, it's the subject and the other, right? There's always a kind of dyadic situation. So for me, thinking about these black male performers, I was very interested in their relationship as subjects to the gaze. And that very much shaped the work that I was doing in Skin Axe. And it shaped, in a sense, what I felt was missing in cultural theory, especially Black cultural theory, where much of our focus seemed to be simply on object the objectification of Black bodies. And I was interested in a more supple understanding of what is happening for the Black performer in relationship to their body, certainly processes of objectification, but what are also some of the processes of subjectification, and what are some of the relational processes. So I was kind of interested in that array. So you can see why I found Jason Holiday Mm -hmm. so fascinating. So then the second kind of area that kind of leads into, into the chapter is I was interested in um, almost reading Lacan himself a little bit from a relational perspective. So one of the, for me, very stimulating aspects of my work with Derek and Sheldon as editors was the ways they kind of pushed me to be explicit about my efforts to read Lacan against the grain. So I picked from my essay, this very odd entity in Lacan's work, which is something called the lamella, which as we talk about the symbolic, the real, the imaginary, all of these very, you know, the object, uh, all of these kind of known jouissance concepts in Lacanian theory. The lamella is a kind of, is a, as, as I think this is a phrase that Derek even used, this odd entity, kind of like almost insignificant in terms of the core of Lacan's theoretical framework, right? But I found it very interesting because when Lacan describes this entity and he discusses it probably at, at most length, I believe it's in, um, it's either in a career or it's in Four Fundamentals. I can't remember right now. One of you, Derek or Sheldon, might be able to clarify that. But where he discusses it at greatest length, it has the quality of the skin. And so, you know, he talks about it enveloping the face. It's an amoeba-like substance. It's much of the way he's descriptively describing it. And the lamella, another way he describes it is as he says, it's like the manlet or in French omelet, 
which is a substance that flies off as the chick releases from an egg, right? So it's almost like this kind of, you know, lining amoeba-like substance, right? And of course, I visualize that as that at the moment of the cut, the signifying cut, something flies off, something else flies off that's in excess, right? And so all of this, but I was noticing it's associations, let's say, psychoanalytically, it's associative relationship to the skin and started to get more interested. Well, what if I what if I took that literally? What if I tried to actually think about this as the skin? And what would that then mean for maybe even a reading uh, and a rereading of Lacan himself, just from this one kind of take this one entity and kind of build out? And that was in a sense how I tried to come to the project. And so in the essay, I look at various aspects of the, of the lamella as they relate to racialization. So on the one hand, I talk about the lamella in comparison with, let's say as skin straightforwardly, but as racialized skin, because even the discussions of skin in psychoanalysis I discovered were not actually putting as fine a point on what is the difference between racialized skin and just skin more broadly. And so Fanon's notion of epidermalism gave me a framework for thinking about just the skin itself, it, one might argue in its more signifying capacities, right? And I talk about that in the essay that this is one of the places where Black studies and Lacan studies have reached, have I, and critical social theory, have I think con, con, come together around the idea of skin and racialized skin and the signifier and the social and symbolic order as being connected, right? But then I got also interested in a couple of other resonances to the lamella. So one seemed to me to have what I what I ended up calling in the essay, it becomes a kind of object for the in the, the desired incorporeality of this of the racializing subject, right? That there is a desire within our contemporary notions of the modern subject, notions on which psychoanalytic theory broadly depends, right? Of a subject that is bodiless, that has, that is really becomes a subject in their detachment from the body. So one could argue, yes, this is the mind-body split, but it's how it, how it plays out psychically. That's so much of the psychoanalytic um, conception of the subject, certainly within Lacan, the body seems to disappear. If anything, sometimes the theory is premised on the idea that one is cut away from the body, right? And so this whole notion of a skinless subject, of a subject that has become, that becomes a subject, more and more of a subject when they're incorporeal, seemed to me another aspect of the lamella that Lacan was partly trying to kind of convey, or there's something about that that was coming across. And I, and I take us through that in the essay, describing it as a kind of fantasy of the skinless subject, right? But on the flip side, and almost the opposite, it also seemed to me Lacan links the lamella in very concrete ways to the body, in ways that are actually quite uh, confusing in his work, right? He calls, he describes the lamella at one point as, think of libido as an organ. The lamella is that organ, right? And so the idea that the lamella is literally a bodily organ, almost like the ur organ of the body. It's, it's the ur organ from which the breast, the phallus, the anus derive, right? Um, and he continues to describe it even in its contours as a rim. It's a rim organ or a portal, right? All of these kinds of elements I developed as a way of trying to think about where the erogenous body and where zones of erogeneity are present in Lacan's work, and that this might be, in a sense, the place in his work, read somewhat more poetically than literally, read a little bit against him um, and, and against the broad structure of his theory, but this might be the place where the corporeal sits in his work. And so I suggested the lamella could also be a way for us to get in touch with something I call in the essay more the flesh as a kind of contrast to the skin, or at least the thing that is the interface between the skin facing outward and the flesh and the aspects of the bodily that are facing inward. And so it really has been, I mean, I would very much consider myself a Lacanian. I think even though, as I say in the essay, the challenge of this whole collection is really, I think, 
you know, attempting to read both with and against Lacan himself simultaneously. But in the essay, I, I came the closest in trying to think about how Lacan himself was trying to gesture towards the corporeal within his own framework. I think that's really good, Michelle. You know, um, I'm working on an essay on ethics right now, and I'm rereading um, I'm rereading Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And there too, Freud himself talks about this external shell that has to be created as a sort of interface between the internal world of stimulus that's connected to the drive and the external world of stimulus that has to be kept out. So I think there's definitely something there. And um, what you're saying about you know, this idea that we are reading Lacan against Lacan and revising Lacan, I think that's central to the project. Um, my own piece on sexuation you know, starts from the idea that uh, uh, at the core of Lacanian thinking is this notion that the subject has to um, has to develop a sense of desire based upon the desire of the other. And so it is the subject's interaction with the external world that constitutes their sense of self. And the, the question that Lacan says the subject has to pose is, um, what am I there, right? And that, that the there portion of that question um, connects the subject to a position. It's a position in question within the symbolic. Um, but it's also a question about desire. It's um, what do you want me to be? What does the other want me to be? And part of what I'm trying to do in ways that I think perfectly align with what you're saying, Michelle, um, is I'm trying to think of the drive as something that constitutes the racialized subject. The drive as something that circles the object A, which I read as the fantasy of race that is outside of the subject. Now, Lacan says that um, the drive has no object. Its aim is to return within its circuit, um, but it leaves the body and comes back to the body. And my sense is that by circling race as this external fantasy object, what the subject does through the drive is insert race into the body. The body, the ego becomes racialized through this process um, of, of taking on something from the outside world. It becomes, you know, Lacan talks about the subject becoming muddled, he says, within a, within a picture, right? And so there's this process of muddling the body, of staining the body that occurs when the subject takes up a place within the external image, within the external picture. Lacan says, I am photographed by the external world and I become that photograph. So there's a sort of insertion of race that happens through the skin, through the body, uh, um, as an entryway into the ego and into a sense of self. Mm -hmm. And you know, why I think I found Jason Holiday interesting is I think there is something, and you, the way that you're theorizing, and Sheila, there's something about the notion of a perverse object or a subject playing with the perverse as opposed to the typical neurotic subject. And you made a reference to that in your essay that really stayed with me. And I found myself, I was like, I want to find out from Sheila how I can find out more about this contrast between the neurotic versus the perverse subject, because I was really compelled by how it almost seemed to me that there is something you were theorizing about Jason Holliday's performance and inhabiting of his subjectivity that moves in ways that are similar to how you were describing the drive, Sheldon, and the circuits of the drive. It's a different interaction with the signifier, with the other, and this is and that structure is something that's different from the neurotic subject, which to me is compelling because I think there is a way, when I said that psychoanalytic notions of subjectivity are kind of derived on a broader conception of subjectivity, I think the neurotic subject is, is has more 
more of the features of this more hegemonic notion of subjectivity. And Black subjects specifically, because of their position within the system, so to speak, perform other notions of subjectivity, some of which psychoanalysts, psychoanalytic theory may, may also be able to account for. And actually, that's what I was finding very stimulating about following along where you were taking us about Jason Holiday. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And, you know, if I could say a little bit more about perversion as a structure within Lacanian theory, I think it's really important to clarify that, you know, within the Lacanian frame, there are essentially three structures, that of neuroses, that of perversion, that of psychoses. And neuroses is, of course, the most sort of typical structure. It's the most commonplace structure. And it is, I think, the structure in which we do most of our work in terms of writing, cultural work, activism, and so on. But for the perverse structure, and, and again, I, I wanna be really careful. I don't wanna say that Jason Holiday is a pervert. Rather, I think, in fact, his discourse and his, his performance sort of fits the template of perversion in the way that Lacan wrote about it, but that's really different from saying that Jason Holiday himself is a pervert. But within the discourse of the pervert, within that structure specifically, there's a way in which the subject is in fact castrated, that is alienated by the signifier in the way in which the neurotic is, but they haven't achieved separation from the other. That is the big capital O other. And as a result, the tyranny of the other, the aggression, the jouissance of the other is in fact unbarred for the pervert. And so one of the pervert's response to the tyranny of the other is to play with the other, to forge a kind of eroticism in relation to being hurt and harmed by the other's unbarred jouissance. Now, of course, the structure of perversion becomes, at least for me, more interesting and complex when you read it in relation to, let's say, anti-Black racism in the way in which Jason Holiday lived and experienced it. Because certainly Holiday was arrested by police. Uh, he was imprisoned on Rikers Island. He was institutionalized by psychiatrists. I mean, he was really subject to a racist set of laws and institutional structures that were unbarred in his life. Now, I think we can imagine a, a common that is typical neurotic response to racism being we must organize about it against this. We must name these laws as racist and unjust and sort of, you know, handle it through legislation, through mass social movements, all of which is absolutely necessary and important. But I think it's also equally important to recognize that the perverts response to racism is different, but I would say equally important. So Holiday's response to racism is to look at it within the lens of comedy. He talks about racism as a joke. It, it's like a scene that must be played out. And he talks about how he in fact played the white women who hired him in more sophisticated ways than they could ever play him. He talks about hustling. So for, you know, for Jason Holiday, the law is nothing that can be held in check. Rather, it's something that has to be negotiated. And so Holiday always tried to get the upper hand, the last word. And he would regularly do this even when the film Portrait of, Ho Portrait of Jason uh, was being shown in New York, you know, he would greet audiences going into the cinema. He would be sitting in the cinema, watching the film, talking back to his own portraits. You know, <laughs> like he was really inserting himself into the cinematic screen, like into the way in which it was distributed. And I think it was a mistake uh, by some portions of like uh, the queer community 
to sideline Jason's discourse, his unique response to anti-Black racism by representing him, you know, as a dupe, as someone who was himself racist. I think we're really missing here the, the comedic uh, perverse response to racism. And so I just wanted to, to clarify that because I think if we, if we really wanna follow Lacan, we have to take the different structures, the different sexuated positions and the different topographies of the subject seriously and recognize that with racism, for example, the systematic anti-Black racism that we're talking about, or at least I was talking about in my chapter, is gonna be really differently experienced by different people. And that is again, why I think Sheldon's work on sexuation and how racism is in fact sexuated is also really important. Because one of the things in my mind that Lacanian psychoanalysis teaches us is that however important the work of let's say Kimberly Crenshaw and helping us to understand intersectionality, however important that is, even that is not enough. Identity-based theorizing is not enough to, under, to help us understand what I would call the psychic life or rather the psychic lives in the plural of racism. Derek, do you want to tell us a little bit about your work, your thoughts? Um, actually, I wanted to add, add some comments. Um, I've been listening to what everyone has said and just to highlight a couple of things, maybe at a slightly meta-theoretical level. Um, I think one of the things that's been Two, two points, really. One is um, I'm so keen to ask Sheila more, um, and Sheldon will anticipate this question, because after uh -oh. finishing the manuscript <laughs> and thinking about um, some of the common denominating reoccurring motifs that we didn't initially foreground to begin with, one of, one of the kind of future areas of research that I'm very interested in is precisely thinking perverse structure and anti-Blackness. And as Sheila said, we, we don't necessarily need to think perverse structure here is reducible to singular individuals, although, you know, presumably clinically, that's one mapping device that can be helpful. But it's, it's once one starts to, to experiment a little bit with that, that notion, all of what is entailed by perverse structure, it starts to link a whole series of different facets of the literature, uh, particularly as we start to think about the role of law and Sheila very nicely foregrounded that for the perverse subject, law is something that is negotiated or, and I'm interested to hear Sheila, if, if you would go along with this, uh, law is seen to be, there's a kind of uh, disrespect or uh, inability to grasp or, or fundamental irreverence towards law. So law needs to be implemented in another way or negotiated or disrespected. Um, and we see these ideas come up in a number of different chapters. So um, E. Chebrilow's uh, white nationalist chapter, which is something Sheldon and I spoke about a little bit before, is very much about the, the sort of lone pioneer um, historical figure for whom law is not enough and they need to implement a law and they need to be some kind of heroic, uh, well, also murderous um, figure um, who acts as they are the instrument of an other jouissance, but they're also implementing law. So this is one um, idea that, that could potentially link back to the notion of perverse structure. Another, of course, is in Frank Wilderson's Afro-Pessimism, uh, I think published last year, um, he says one of the things, one of the areas where Lacanians haven't really developed adequately the notion of jouissance is that jouissance is everywhere when there is slavery, for example. And jouissance is everywhere where there is anti-Blackness. Uh, and Sadia Hartman's um, Scenes of Subjection, as, as in, in the opening couple of chapters, talks about enjoyment um, at length. And only, only tacitly links it a little bit to some Zizekian formulations, but I think there's a lot more to be said there. Um, then, you know, there, there's other examples of what, uh, as well, one where one can approach what is happening with the attempt to reinstantiate law and, 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 and also law in the form of police law and order, those kinds of things. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Maybe we can come back to that. 
Um, and I'm really curious, Sheila, to see what you think about that, because I think it's, it's a really important area for, for Lacanian thinking to take forward in, in thinking about anti-Blackness. And then just also very briefly, um, Michelle, just to say also, you know, as with everyone here, how much I, I enjoyed your chapter, but to also add a couple of um, comments. One, you know, the lamella concept is, is so evasive at times, but one of the things I think your chapter does so wonderfully is to say, there's a whole series of ideas that come to the forefront with Fanon's idea of epidermalization. And, um, and one of them that is perhaps not being accented enough, and of course, which is exactly what you do, is to say when there's epidermalization, in other words, when there's some kind of objective reduction of a human subject to this, the surface of the skin, to blackness, particularly uh, paradigmatically, what that also entails is not just objectification and you know some traumatic reduction of subjectivity to the status of an object, all of these things, but it also entails a kind of libidinalization of skin. Um, and of course, what, what you go on to do so well is also to emphasize the lethality of Lamella, and Lamella being this figure which seems to incarnate impossibly also this uh, impasse, this uh, uh, antinomy within Lacanian theory that libido, he doesn't want to make it simply organ physicality, you know, he's, he's aware of a kind of biological reductionism, but nevertheless gives us this mythic figure of lamella, which is impossibly an impossible organ, which to take steps further, um, does this amazing thing, where it is both crucial life, life without end, life, life pivotal, uh, lethal life, and in, in other words, it overlaps life and death. And I think you're quite right. I think that that's a, um, a difficult concept, but I think it tells us so much about epidermalization and, and the life of skin in racism, whereby skin is both libidinalized, sexualized. And remember all, you know, Stuart Hall talking about um, Fanon and talking about um, the gaze and how the gaze is not just, the gaze is also um, an act of voyeuristic. And I suppose maybe we link back here to perversion, but a, 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 an implementation of desire, a seeing and wanting to see more, to see through. Um, so not only is the skin libidinalized, but there's also something about uh, maybe it's a projection or an investment with a certain lethality on that skin. And last point, then, then I really will stop. The other thing I think, Michelle, that your chapter does so remarkably is, is talk about the, the incorporeality. In other words, the more we libidinize in, in let's say, white racist economies, uh, psychical economies, the more the skin of the person of color, which is an apt phrase here, right? Like the more that skin is libidinized and made to figure as other, the more white skin is, is, is not so much corporeal. And I think what your chapter also takes us to is how, how some bodies become massively corporealized and physicalized and not just corporealized and physicalized, but somehow made object um, physicalities, which are more somehow more likely and more, more viably to be death bound. Whereas certain other subjects, and of course we're talking about whiteness here, seem to be given a more transcendent psychical dimension. And it's not just about social construction, it's about that as well, but the incorporeal body of whiteness is not somehow reducible in fantasy and in social construction to the merely bodily, right? It attains a kind of transcendent status, and that is strictly equivalent to the libidinal investment and the lethal investment in making sure bodies of color are, are more corporealized. And I think the lamella motif really um, illustrates that and, and gives us a, a crucial way of thinking about it. Even if at the end of this theoretical journey, we, might, we may say, okay, lamella, interesting, we can now also think about it in other terms, which of course you do, Michelle, you, you bring in Deleuze and Guattari. Anyway, so just some topics. I don't know if anyone wants to take up any of those things, but they're, they're tremendously important. And I think they, they show us how a certain form of psychoanalytic theory will take us beyond what other theoretical vocabularies can do. I have some responses, um, so I'll, I'll jump in. Something that your comments made me think of, Derek, which is, um, if I can put this thought together, that one of the things I've appreciated about the Afro-pessimistic critique is precisely the, um, 
the pushback on the idea that we should be striving to get to that transcendent incorporeal subjectivity, right? So the, the edge of the Afro-pessimist critique that says there is no place for the black subject within, it's not defined that way, it's, it's just ontologically, there's no blackness within that notion of subjectivity. The notion of the black subject to the degree there is one is fundamentally the, you know, uh, outside of that. Uh, that has been actually clarifying for me because, but clarifying, but then some, you know, um, some more pessimistic, not just specifically Afro-pessimistic moves within critical social theory and somewhat within psychoanalytic theory is to feel like that's the end of the story. Like, oh my God, the subject is dead. You know, what do we do, right? And that's partly why I was so intrigued by then this notion of perverse structure, because structures, because I've always felt that coming from black studies, but we're still here, <laughs> you know? And so why can't psychoanalysis theorize the alternative modes of subjectivity that are still here, right? And so, and that in a sense, that kind of challenge is what has probably animated my work is to say, we are all in the same world. So psychoanalytic theory might be able to help me understand or Lacanian theory might be able to help me understand what are some of these other structures in dialogue interdisciplinarily with other theories, specifically people, the, the field of scholars who've been theorizing Black subjectivity. So I think that's partly what helped me to, you know, I had to build up my confidence in the idea that there are other notions of Black subjectivity beyond the essentialized, corporealized subject that is the counter to the transcendent, liberal, you know, incorporeal subject. And I, and, and I can believe that there are other. And so in Fanon himself, it was so um, revelatory for me when Fanon himself made the distinction between the epidermal and the corporeal. And as the speaking subject describes his perception of his own body in different ways, as as a physiological body moving in the world, as a body being inscribed upon and projected upon by the other. And I was like, there it is. There is Fanon himself describing that he has other ways of expressing himself. He's also saying that they are incredibly oppressed by the mantle of race that drops on him. And much of Black Skin White Mass is him struggling with that signifier, but he did suggest that he can get in touch with other aspects of himself. And that, that in a way, full circle come back around is actually what I then started to hear a little bit in Lacan on the lamella, and even in some of his writings on feminine jouissance. You know, I started to look for kind of this alternative corporeality within what I was reading. That's so interesting, Michelle. And um, uh, just briefly to respond to some of Derek's comments, very helpful thoughts on the law with respect to the perverse structure. And one of the associations I made when I was listening was something actually I heard Sheldon say in one of your previous presentations about how <clears throat> you know everyone agrees that race is socially constructed, but nobody wants to give it up. Right, there's a way in which race has a cultural salience and is really significant to one's sense of self as a subject, you know, almost regardless of racialization. There's a way in which we're not going to give race up. And I think I, I'm imagining how to think about that within the context of the perverse structure and also within the context of Jason Holliday's really specific response to the law in his performance. And, you know, when he's being asked in the interview to talk about race or to talk about who he is, to come clean, so to speak, to tell the truth about what is his real name? What, you know, what has his life really been like? What Jason keeps doing repeatedly is he dramatizes harmful enactments, incidents of racism, and then he laughs and seems to take pleasure in the very ways in which he's been harmed. And I think if we're gonna be honest and listen carefully to his discourse, and his response to the law, like the law of the other to be honest and come clean, 
we have to acknowledge that he's saying on some fundamental level that he cannot exist without the ways in which he has been effaced. The effects of the modalities through which he has been recognized as a sexualized, racially specific subject is not something he can be without. It's not something he can separate from his being. And I think that this is really disturbing on some level to those of us who really take anti-racist organizing seriously. And, and I'm one of those people. You know, there's a kind of fantasy that the law can be held in check. There's this idea that there is a subject who can be liberated from the harms of racism or sexism or transphobia or whatever they might be. But I think when we're looking at questions of eros and desire and jouissance and frankly masochism, we need to be really honest about the fact that one of the ways in which we survive the tyranny of the other is to eroticize the very ways in which we've been hurt. And if we think about racism in terms of eroticism, we need to acknowledge that some of the really devastating traumas of race are things that cannot be let go of on some fundamental level relating to the subject. So whenever we're asking for a truth about racism, I always think Lacan is right when he says the truth can only be half set and there's always going to be something extra, something that he says is real, that is with a capital R real, that is in excess of the signifier. It's in excess of anything that can be said or seen. And this is why I really like the James Baldwin quote, I believe in the devil finds work when he says that race is more resounding than real. And by this, I take him to mean that race and racism is not something that can be identified or, or quarantined or pinpointed. It's something that, that resounds. It's something, it's not, almost like an acoustic, but one that you can't hear. It's a set of vibrations that defines the milieu. And I think that the pervert's response to the law, certainly as enacted by Holiday, gives us a way to understand something beyond the reality of racism, whereby we can get to the real of racism that concerns the subject. How's that, Derek? That's great. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, Sheila, that distinction between the real versus the reality of racism is really important. There's another story by Baldwin um, called Going to Meet the Man, in which um, Baldwin talks about a protagonist who witnessed a lynching. And the story opens up with the protagonist trying to have sex with his girlfriend, and he can't get an erection. But by the end of the story, he's sort of traveled back into the past, remembers his childhood with his, with his father and remembers his father taking him to witness a lynching. And then by the end of the story, we're back um, in the bedroom with him and his girlfriend and he is rock hard after thinking about the lynching. And I think part of what um, Baldwin is showing us there is the ways in which um, race isn't just about uh, embodied reality, but also about psychic pleasure. And, and I think that's why the term jouissance is so important, right? What is it that gets him up? It's his jouissance, it's pleasure. There's, you know, uh, Freud and Lacan talk about um, the elasticity of jouissance, the elasticity of the drives, the way that they're transferred from one zone to another zone, from one object to another object. And here what we get is an investment of pleasure that's connected to the mutilation of Black men that becomes eroticized, right? And, um, so I... 
I think part of what the very concept of jouissance allows us to see is that when we're dealing with race, we're not dealing with something that's rational. You know, Michelle began by discussing the ways that we think we can teach people to not be racists, right? But it's not, it's not about what they know, it's about what they feel, and not just what they feel at an emotional level, but what they feel at an unconscious level. It's about the ways that um, race can inflect upon our actions without us consciously recognizing it. And so the effort to transcend race, as we say, um, is fraught. There's a particular piece in the collection by um, Jennifer Friedlander in which Jennifer makes an interesting point that um, we're in a moment where people feel that they see past race. Um, they see past race as an illusion. But what that does is often it frames our vision precisely around race. We see things in terms of seeing past race. So we think that we've, you know, we've, we've gotten to some sort of truth that yet still binds us to race. And so there are all of these ways that race, um, race remains both valuable and in some ways ensnaring. You know, race, I think for African-Americans, has been a utility. It's been a tool of survival, no doubt. Um, people like um, not just Baldwin, but also Ralph Ellison has talked about race as, a, as, a, as enabling a certain discipline, a sort of ethical behavior in African-Americans, a mode of overcoming. You know, and you see this in the blues, you see this in jazz music, there's a sort of performativity that's connected to these notions of perversion. Um, there's, there's a sort of uh, flexibility in one's actions um, that is facilitated by the very need to survive racism. But at the same time, the, the concept of race um, is so ensnaring, so entrapping. Well, thank yeah. you all so much for this book. It's so important and that's why I wanted to be sure to have you on. And as I mentioned before we started recording, I just finished editing Gautam's episode. So people will have already heard that and heard a bit about his chapter as well. Um, and I also want to make sure before we wrap up that we mentioned your conference coming up, Sheldon, The Psychology of the Other. Yes, uh, we have put together nine panels to speak at this conference, including uh, most of the contributors, plus some extra people like David Marriott and um, Lee Edelman. Uh, Michelle will be moderating a panel with Lee and David. Um, there's also uh, Zahi. Zalua, um, who has written an interesting text on Zizok and race. Um, so he'll be on one of the panels. Robert Bashara, who has also written on race. Clint Burnham, Stephanie Spales, and Carol Owens. Um, Nigel Gibson, Daniel um, Gustam Bidi, uh, Leswin. Uh, Loopshire and a bunch of others. Um, so we'll have a focus. There'll be tracks in, in, in the conference. One track will focus on Lacan and race and another will focus on Fanon and phenomenology. So we're, what we're trying to do is extend the conversation that we started in this text by bringing in other people who are doing interesting work in this area. So it should be really interesting. The conference is um, September 17th to the 19th at Boston College, but the entire event will be, um, will be hosted online. And it will open by, it will open with a keynote by Homi Baba. And it also includes a plenary by our own Derek Hook. I have already signed up. <laughs> yes, Michelle will be moderating too for Derek. <laughs> oh, and can we just say, please, please, get the book. Um, just one quick word for your viewers who can actually see this image. 
we really love this image and it brings together some of the themes of the text um, and some of the chapters of the text. Um, Michelle talked about skin as lamella. I think there's interest in resonance with that idea here. Here you have um, an image of the dripping white paint on someone's hand that covers the body. And if you look really closely, it's dripping on the face in the Rutledge, um, in the Rutledge <laughs> logo, right? But it brings together some really interesting concepts. You know, the white nationalist shooter, the hand of the, 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 um, the gun seems to be represented here. My focus on um, blackface minstrelsy in my chapter, um, and a, a whole bunch of other resonances, um, Fanon's um, black skin, white masks. So um, um, it represents the broad topics of the text, which I think people will really enjoy if they purchase it and dig into it. Yeah, and I will link to it so they can easily click to get it. <laughs> and I will also link to Derek's YouTube channel because it's fantastic. And so while people are waiting for the conference, they can learn Lacan from Derek. Thanks. From my garage, remember, with the <laughs> you know homemade blackboard and the bicycles and stuff. I love it. Actually, <laughs> I saw it, I saw it once, Derek, and I was like, oh wow, that's such a great idea. <laughs> it's you know, also it's helpful. Thanks. It's kind of excruciatingly embarrassing as well because, you know, I don't know, but whatever. Thanks for watching. And it's worth checking out from time to time. You know Agreed. what? I would say it's definitely worth checking out. I was just telling Derek before we began here that I developed a graduate course at York University called Race, Psyche, and Sexuality. And I chose mainly Lacanian texts. And of course, the students were like, oh my goodness, all of this Lacan. And so I thought, well, how can I make Lacan fun and engaging and just sort of, you know, get them enveloped? And so I thought, I know I'm going to show Derek's YouTube videos. And of course, the students love them <laughs> and did the readings. And I'm thrilled to report at the end of the course, my students were saying, how could we ever begin to think we could understand racism without Lacan, without psychoanalysis? And so I thought that was a really lovely, you know, note to end the course on. And also, you know, our gathering here, I just want to thank Derek and Sheldon so much for being yeah. such you know, brilliant and committed and, you know, all around fabulous editors. This has been a pleasure to be part of this book. And, um, and also Michelle, like your work is fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to reading your chapter in depth. So, and thanks again, Vanessa, for bringing us all together. Same, like, ditto on all. Was there anything else anyone wanted to mention before we wrap up? Just a final thank you for having us on, Vanessa. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, you all are welcome in any uh, conglomeration, individual or pairs or threes or fours. And like I said, um, after doing this, I think it'd be really fun for me to do more like group talks. We have like little mini panels um, instead of just one-on-one -on -one all the time. So thanks for that idea. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. And Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Sheldon George, Derek Hook, Michelle Stevens, and Sheila Cavanaugh. Be sure to check out their groundbreaking work, Lacan and Race, Racism, Identity, and Psychoanalytic Theory from Rutledge. Also be sure to check out their other books. Links to all of their work can be found in the text accompanying this episode. I've also done previous interviews with Sheldon George and Derek Hook. You can check out Rendering Unconscious episode 42 with Derek Hook and Rendering Unconscious episode 106 with Sheldon George. The conference Psychology and the Other is coming up September 17th through 19th and is virtual. 
So be sure to join us at Psychology and the Other 2021. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. You can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org, for links and more information. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Tripart Books, 2019. For more information, you can visit our publisher's website, tripart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 2-3-C-A-R-L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. Along with 
unless we settle pharmaceuticals. We have no guarantee for either happiness or understanding of ourselves during a major and a while. I make a mirror, something to see myself in. Where to look for guidance and insight? Well, there are lifestyle of a wife and two. But most often only for David Bowie. Like a flash, touching upon the individual sphere. If we instead look outside and far away, we can see, yes, homage. The living to what exactly? Up? That's the task of me, work things out. And, and they didn't, didn't even have, have to. Man, am, am I that? Resources to supplement formal training with what, what they fear most by a heart of stone. You, of, of many, many books, books where shame is chiseled. chiseled. When, when the sun sets, we are wrapped in darkness and, and despair. Space is, is empty. empty. Black, enormous, almost invisible. His life containing a myriad of tiny, tiny starlights and allegedly filled with devouring black holes came to experiments, threatening asteroids and aliens. Although, ass up, locking things we can't direct. Drawing of the Renaissance and our senses. We are still sensory driven more than anything else. Always have been. A, a new form of fire and fear. When the sun rises, the senses are alerted. We can see what's tangible. Have never, as I think, at all understood thee. When I worry, the message is lost in sweet note. Processes. Most of us structure our active lives based, and then, she says that the speakers can choose. Have thee, or we'll have to use force in my, on the visibility of the sun, and then retract when it's no longer visible. One could say this is new simplification. Sun affects us by heat, rebirth cycles, 
direct, direct tangible ways. We take the sun for granted and act the same, adapt our lives and cultures around it. An energy embodies the moon, affects us by reflected light and timelessness and purity. Relish magnetic force, quite a different story. Let me know what life but the moon regulates it, and the sea exposing ourselves began saging me, thereby controlling human destiny to a greater and more tangible extent. Me who brought thee, the future will know their own kind. Embellish human existence, but the convention forbids body corresponds to the present throughout. Tissue that structures, binds, and supports. It is 